At this point, realizing how many people I've hurt or how many people I've inspired to say awful things or, or do anything awful, like to finally just own up to all of this and be accountable is worth losing everything to me. I need a scarecrow after what you did Cause all of the birds know that I'm almost dead I'm barely breathing, I'm barely awake You left me in pieces, there's no more to break Century. Don't wake me up Cause you're just a ghost inside my head You're just a ghost, you're never there You're just a memory on my lips Cause you're just a ghost inside
Cause you're just a ghost inside my head You're just a ghost, you're never there Before we officially get things going, would like to recommend to everybody that you watch this video in its entirety before forming an opinion about it. Especially since I'll be covering super heavy subject matter. You know, ironically enough, when I created the concept of the YouTubers Unmasked series, I always imagined that I would be the one doing the unmasking. But here we have a situation where the internet has done the unmasking for me. This unmasking in particular was done to none other than Shane Lee. Uh, that's seriously his real name. Shane Dawson, everybody. The guy who played a coconut on the Annoying Orange. Remember that? <laughs> My name is Coconut, master <laughs> of Kung Fu, yes. and soon, <laughs> this very so kitchen. So oh, well. He also played a donut in a different episode, but that one isn't as good. Now, if you've been living under a rock for the past several months and don't know what's going on, then let me put it in the most simplest terms that I can. You see, this little piggy uploads half-assed YouTube documentaries, this little piggy was involved in the cancellation of James Charles. This little piggy borderline molested his pets. This little piggy did a lot of blackface. And last but certainly not least, this big piggy has a history of sexualizing children. I might have athlete's foot. Now this came as a shock to a lot of us. Uh, at one point he was considered YouTube's golden boy, the king of YouTube, a hero. Really. But in early summer of this year, Shane experienced one of the biggest cancellations that I have ever seen. Sorry, you're cancelled. I personally don't like cancel culture, but for the meme, the next time a big YouTuber gets cancelled, please tweet them that clip of the Black Knight Ghost. Thank you. Now a lot of you may be curious on why exactly this video is titled The Duality of Shane Dawson. I've seen many people treating the old Shane as a different person, and that includes people in Shane's camp. When I watch them, I'm like, who is that? I don't feel like that's a person that I know. It's a difficult situation because I'm not coming at this from, you know, the viewpoint and the perspective of somebody who has watched Shane on the internet for years. While they were far in his past, it's hard to separate that person from who he is today, especially when you're seeing them in real time and your feelings are being hurt right now. I find it really fascinating because this reverts to the old duality of man concept. For anyone who's not familiar with this, people use it in a couple different ways. The first being that people try to always boil each other down into being just one thing, which is wrong because human beings are such complex creatures. But the second, which is the one that I want to focus on, is the idea that every single human has good and evil within them. There's actually an author by the name of Robert Louis Stevenson who explored this concept in one of his novels. And if that name doesn't sound familiar to you, he is the one who wrote The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And if you've never read the book, then you've most likely at the very least have heard of the character and understand his shtick. Okay, so after talking to a few people, maybe Jekyll and Hyde aren't as mainstream as I thought. To sum it up, the novella revolves around our two titular characters, Henry Jekyll and Edward Hyde. The narrator is Utterson, Jekyll's lawyer friend. Utterson spends the book investigating why Jekyll is involved with this Hyde character because he is all bad news. The big twist at the end is that Utterson discovers that Jekyll and Hyde are actually the same person. Jekyll had been testing experiments on himself, and one of them created the Hyde persona. This causes Jekyll to mutate to Hyde, who looks completely different from him and really brings out his evil side. It's a curse that Jekyll has to carry around for the rest of his life. Truly, a tragic tale. I did also want to mention that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby thought that this was such a good idea for a character that they just ripped it off and created Bruce Banner and the Hulk. Four characters two halves of a coin that hate each other. Jekyll and Hyde and Bruce and Hulk are both the biggest interpretations of the duality of man in fiction history. Evil and good are always at war inside you, Zuko. It is your nature. 
So I want to use the cancellation of Shane Dawson as a chance to explore this idea. How much has Shane Dawson truly changed over the span of his YouTube career? Does he actually have a Jekyll and Hyde thing going on? And of course, are his latest scandals just old jokes from a different time, or should we be taking them extremely seriously? We are going to get into all of it. Now in honor of this whole duality thing, this video will be split into two parts. In the first half of this video, I will be critically examining Shane Dawson's whole career, which includes the majority of the content he has ever put out. Mostly because I think it's very important to take a look at the whole picture, you know, see what he chooses to put out there. And in the second half of this video, we will be looking at all of his controversies and depicting what he's guilty of and what has been blown completely out of proportion. So let's just get things started because this man has put out so much content over the past 12 plus years. What's cracking, YouTubers? In case you don't know me, my name is Shane. Nice to meet you. Oh, that's Shane started off by not making videos, but short films for his high school. This was way back in 2005, and if you need help remembering that year, then just think about YouTube entering its inception, Resident Evil 4, and the first Madagascar movie. Now it's important to know that at this point in his life, Shane was 400 pounds and extremely insecure. To his surprise, teachers and students actually liked his short films. Now once Shane actually got access to the internet, he started surfing the net and discovered a little site where there was a video of a young man at the zoo. So on September 21st of 2005, Shane created his first ever YouTube channel and uploaded the films that he was making in high school. Within the next few years, Shane lost all the weight and started pursuing a career in traditional entertainment. And in order to do that, he got himself an agent, and it's because of said agent that Shane decided to change his last name. Being a fan of Dawson's Creek, Shane saw it fitting to change his last name after the titular character. Please be impressed by my vocabulary. Now we cut into 2008, and Shane is not doing so well as an actor. He can't land a role to save his life. Something I can relate to. After going through some self-reflection, he looked back at his old YouTube channel that has been collecting dust bunnies for years. It turns out that that channel had gained a little bit of a following. This made the hamster in Shane's brain start to sprint on its little wheel, and on March 10th of 2008, he created the Shane Dawson TV channel, where he vowed to post videos on a regular basis. His videos started off as vlogs, talking to the camera about how his day was going. Seriously, between work and trying to be an actor and all that stuff, I just need something else. So. Here's the plan. Every week or couple days, depending on how bloggy I'm feeling, um, there'll be a new video. Just random stuff. But soon after talking about subjects like how much it sucks to work at Jenny Craig and how he was this close on being casted as the lead in I Love You Beth Cooper, he decided to improve his content by making sketches. Just to clarify, that Beth Cooper thing was just a little joke. He has no merit whatsoever. Locking friends, he needed to somehow fill up the roles in his sketches, so he just decides to play every character. This is where you start to see characters like Aunt Hilda, Paris Hilton, and most notably, Shanae. He also eventually got into the world of parodies. It's also important to note that this is the type of content that really allowed people to get a, a taste of a sense of humor. Mm. Mm, that's, a, that's a bit racy, don't you think? I bring that point up because it's that comedic style that has gotten him into a lot of trouble in current day. Both his characters and parodies led to a very meteoric rise in the summer of 2009. By September of that year, he was the fifth most subscribed channel and every video he uploaded would get millions and millions of views. Just to remind the TikTok generation that may be watching this, those kinds of views back in 2009 that was a huge deal. All right, honey? All right, sweetie? You you enjoying that Capri Sun you're sipping on? Hmm? By 2010, Shane's channel had gained 1 million subscribers and a ton of notoriety. So much so that Shane began collaborating with a bunch of YouTubers, but the two that I wanted to highlight are Michael Gallagher and The Fine Bros. And I wanted to do that because I will be talking about those collaborations later on in the video. At this point, Shane was even getting recognized in the mainstream. His merch was being sold at Hot Topic, he was winning awards at the Streamies, he was being interviewed on USA Today, and he was even on Forbes list of online celebrities. By the time we roll around to 2011, the quality of Shane's content had improved tenfold. Expensive cameras, good lighting, and casting actors, Craigslist or otherwise. Now it's important to keep two things in mind here. One, the offensive humor continued to escalate, and one might argue that it was because of the higher productions. And two, Shane was still seriously trying to break into traditional media. I don't want to get too much into it, but there were a few TV and movie deals that ended up falling through for him. Which is unfortunate, because back then Shane definitely treated YouTube as a stepping stone into actual filmmaking. Now that I've given a pretty detailed look at his early career, I would like to critically examine all of the mediums that he has explored. For the sake of time, I decided to cut the music career segment. All you need to know is that Shane would make parodies dressing up as celebrities and his original characters, but then he started making original music which was a mix of Avril Lavigne meets Drake Bell. That stuff is okay, but only if that's your type of music. 
Besides, podcasts are way better. But I just want you guys to know that I'm going to say anything and everything, mm-hmm. so is Lauren. Mm-hmm. Probably not Rebecca Black, because she's smarter than us. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I don't want you guys to be offended or anything. Let's just all have fun, you know? In late spring slash early summer of 2013, Shane Dawson created his very own podcast called Shane and Friends. You're watching Shane Dawson and Friends, with the excitement never ends. The premise is pretty basic. Shane and his co hosts would talk shop about what they don't like is happening in pop culture for the first 20 to 30 minutes, and then they bring on a guest to interview. Now, the podcast goes through three different eras. The first is with Shane's original co-host, Lauren Schnipper. Once she leaves the show, Shane has a few guest co-hosts on. The second era starts once Shane makes a woman by the name of Jesse Buttafuoco the permanent co-host. And the third era begins once Shane starts working with a company called Fullscreen to make the show bigger and better. With all that being said, I did not listen to all 139 episodes of the podcast, just because I'm not one of Jigsaw's victims who's looking for new and creative ways to torture me. And that's not me saying that I think this podcast is bad or anything, I just don't deem it necessary to listen to over 140 hours of this podcast. However, I did deem it necessary to listen to every single episode that's in the first era. Now, here's what's not going to happen. I'm not going to get into all the clips of the racism, bestiality, and pedophilia that take place throughout the show, just because those are all again sections later on in the video, so I'll bring them up then. So instead, let's talk about the dynamic between Shane and his original co-host, Lauren. For those who are unaware, Shane hired Lauren back in 2011 in order to do a bunch of the behind-the-scenes stuff for his videos. She would hire actors, she would go out and get whatever props were needed and she was just the overall producer while Shane would perform in the videos and also edit them they were a dynamic duo they related to each other on so many different levels and if you actually go back and listen to their episodes they have a pretty good back and forth the issue was Lauren doesn't really fit as an online personality. She wasn't really ever in the loop when it came to YouTube stuff. She also wasn't really funny, and she would get upset if she didn't get to talk much. And I understand why she would, but the priority of the show should be the conversation between Shane and his guest. At least that's what I wanted it to be. Feel free to disagree, but I think the show became way better once Lauren left and Jesse took her place. With Shane and Jesse, they were closer in age, their friendship was still fresh, and I just think Jesse is a very funny person. But with all that being said, if you're feeling nostalgic and want to go back and listen to Shane and Friends, I would say, hey, don't. I'll put it this way. As a kid, I loved the live action movie of Fat Albert that came out in 2004. Now. Am I really gonna tarnish those good memories by rewatching it with my adult eyes? No. Point being that there were a few times listening to these old episodes that I found myself pissed off. Yes, because of all the terrible jokes that were made by Shane, but also... God, I just, I just have all this useless information about uh, Paris Hilton and Farrah Abraham in my brain. God, two human beings that I completely forgot existed. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. I'm so glad I had to sit through all that. Um, so this one is uh, from sdarmy.com. Uh, if you go to the podcast section, you can leave the comments and we'll be reading them. I read them on the toilet. Not going to spend too much time on this, but Shane Dawson has a bad history with having websites that are dedicated to his content and fans. The first being sdarmy.com. During the first era of Shane and Friends, Shane would always plug sdarmy.com at the end of each episode and would read comments that people left on the website. At some point, Shane abandons the website and just stops interacting with it completely. People kept using it in order to discuss things all about Shane, but... At some point, it just became a cesspool. And for those of you thinking, oh, what's so bad about it? I have now seen Shane Dawson's penis. That is not even a joke. There was a thread called Shane's Nudes, and I clicked on it. Gulp, for research purposes, obviously. And lo and behold, someone left a link to their Twitter account where they tweeted out a screenshot of this. <laughs> Now I blacked this out for transparent reasons, so let me uh, paint you a better picture. Shane is wearing the white t-shirt, you can see that, um, and nothing else. And the reason I know that is because he's holding up that black trash can, but what he doesn't know, that in the reflection of the black trash can, you can see his penis. Uh, and I nicknamed it Little Dawson. Yep, there he is, there's Little Dawson, kitsch kitsch goo. <laughs> so stupid. To all my fellow creators out there, I know it's cool to not wear pants while filming videos, but I beg of you, don't. Look at me, I'm wearing black jeans, okay? 
the entire time I'm filming this video, okay? Do that. Maybe not black jeans, but you know, something. Now, I don't know which video this is from. For all I know, it could be one of the public videos that are still out there, or it could be one of the many videos that Shane privated this year. If you try to find sdrb.com, it no longer exists. However, I did find a thread that may clear up what happened. Go to Google, search SD Army, click on this website when it comes up in the search results. Not any of the subforums, this is beneath it, in smaller text, just the website. Does it also take you to something like adultfriendfinder.com or is it just me? Warning, on the homepage of the website, you may or may not be taken to There is a Naked Woman. That's right, it would appear that somebody picked up the website and made it so that it would redirect everybody to some porn-esque website. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, the exact same thing happened to the other Shane Dawson website that I wanted to bring up. This one is ShaneDawsonTV.com. Now with SDArmy.com, there's no present day proof of what that thread claims. If you try to Google SD Army now, all that'll pop up is the military's presence in South Dakota. But if you do try to go to ShaneDawsonTV.com, it will redirect you to a Polish escort service. I don't have a sharp enough wit to make that up. Disclaimer, disclaimer, I do not condone you guys going to this website, nor do I condone you trying to look for Shane Dawson's penis online. <sighs> don't ever say I don't do anything for you guys. I'm a complete asshole. I'm selfish, I'm self-absorbed, and I suck pretty much all of the time. Yeah, well, you're just stating the obvious. But I want to change. Shane got to be a part of three film projects, and I refer to these movies as the Shane Dawson Trilogy, even though he only directed and produced one of them. Let's first talk about Smiley, a horror movie which was made back in 2012 and directed by Michael Gallagher, who I referenced earlier. I'm gonna be blunt, this film sucks. It's not scary, cheap jump scares, not a fan of the cinematography, the color correction is bizarre, and some of the actors do okay, but the rest don't really do that much for me. The premise for the movie is kind of interesting on paper, but I just hate the execution. Also, I think the movie thinks it's smarter than it actually is. It does things that seem like parody, but then takes itself super seriously. I did it for the votes. And the twists at the end are nothing. They're, they're not even good, they're just nothing. This movie isn't even entertainingly bad, which is what I hoped for. Don't watch it. And now if we were gonna go in chronological order, Not Cool would, would be next, but you know what, let's save that for last. Let's go to a movie called Internet Famous. This came out back in 2016, and it is shot as a mockumentary. You get the usual suspects. It stars Shane Dawson, Steve Green, and Roger Bart with Michael Gallagher once again in the director's chair. It's like when Adam Sandler puts Kevin James, Rob Schneider, and Steve Buscemi in everything. Now I will say, Internet Famous is better than Smiley. It's still bad, and I would still choose not to watch it, but it has slight improvements. I'd be lying if I said I didn't catch myself chuckling a few times. But with that being said, the comedy is still subpar, and doesn't do cringe humor that well. I think the biggest problem with the film is that nearly all the characters are unlikable. How can you expect the audience to be invested if none of us are rooting for the ensemble? The only arc that's kind of interesting is Wendy McCombs' character, but that's still not enough to carry the whole movie. Don't feel the need to watch this movie either. Before we get into Not Cool, I, I, just, I don't like when I see all these YouTube videos blaming Shane of how these movies came out. Check out the IMDB, he did nothing for behind the scenes, he only acted in them. It's so clear that these creators are just using Shane's name for clickbait because he's such a hot button issue this year. Actually, a YouTuber by the name of William Max Show made a great video on the slippery slope of YouTube. In it, he talks about how people did a similar thing to Logan Paul after the Japanese force incident happened. Go check it out. Okay, let's talk about it. The 2014 classic, Not Cool. Shane Dawson's directorial debut, and it doesn't go well. Surprise, surprise. It's just not good. Also, this isn't me just hating to hate. If I actually liked any of these movies, I would say it. But to its credit, I think Drew Monson is the best part of Not Cool. Drew was the only one that really made me laugh. As for Shane's character, he has this whole Drake Bell thing going on. Which is fine, but there's a reason you really don't see Drake Bell carry a movie without the assistance of an ensemble. Now there's a reason why I brought up Adam Sandler earlier. If Sandler was in his 20s and built his career on YouTube, I can see him making a movie like this. Not Cool has the cadence of a Sandler flick, but it's just way more sexual and offensive. 
offensive. Even Adam Sandler has boundaries. I can enjoy edgy and offensive humor, but as long as it's done right. But I already dedicated a segment of Shane's offensive humor later on in the video, so I'll put a pin in it for now. To get back to Not Cool, Jeremy Lee and Michelle Ventimiglia also star in the movie, and they do an okay job. I don't blame them at all, though. The movie doesn't give them a ton. The narrative clearly revolves around Shane Dawson's and Drew Monson's characters way more. One last time, Not Cool? Just don't watch it. By the way, is it obvious that I'm a film major? I don't know if that came across or... Oh, there it is. <laughs> Uh, I do have a Letterboxd account though, so if you want to follow me on there, I always do these in-depth reviews of any movie I watch. Now, Not Cool is surrounded by controversy. The reason Shane was able to make this movie was because it was part of a reality show called The Chair. The premise for the show is that two upcoming filmmakers each get to make a movie, and at the end of the season, the audience gets to decide who made the better movie. Needless to say, The Chair paints Shane in a very bad light. I'm not taking anything out of the movie to please a bunch of out-of-work actors in Pittsburgh who should be lucky to get an audition for a feature film. I think no director has ever taken anything out of a movie to get somebody to what, audition. Shane? I'm angry that we're finding out about this two days before we start filming the movie. You see him get angry, he's screaming, and he looks like a huge asshole. Now, I will say that it is very stressful making a full-length feature film, especially when it's your first time. Back in my senior year in high school, I directed a one-act play. I remember it was so stress-inducing that the night before the big performance, I ended up screaming out of anger and frustration, and I hid away from everybody for like half an hour. Definitely not one of my best moments, and I absolutely regret it looking back on it. Also, reality shows always edit their episodes to push the narrative they want the audience to eat up. But with that being said, Shane obviously should not have behaved that way. He allowed his emotions to get the better of him, and the chair ate that shit up. And while we're on the subject, Not Cool is one of the big reasons why Lauren decided to not work with Shane anymore. It was getting to be too much for her. Anyway, the people at the chair were not happy with Shane's final product. It's honestly a big reason why Shane wasn't able to transition into traditional media like he's been dreaming of for so long. It's also worth mentioning right before the huge cancellation of 2020 took place, Shane uploaded a video called The Demon in My House. In it, he talks about how he finally wants to make a horror movie like he's always wanted to. Since he hasn't been on YouTube in several months, I assume he's finished writing this horror film, but who knows. Now, the big thing about hearing Shane going back into filmmaking it just throws a bunch of red flags up in the air. Is this one gonna suck as well, or will it actually be good? I will say that he has grown out of his shitty sense of humor, and I do like horror, so I want to give this movie a chance whenever it ends up being made. But if this one sucks, then there's just there's no hope for you, Shane. I'm sorry. But I mean, as a New York best-selling author, you'll be fine. What a segue. So as you guys know, I wrote a book. It's called I Hate Myself. It's available now, now, now. And I'm also writing my second book right now. It's not available, but it will be. I was never really a fan when the YouTuber book trend happened. I would have been fine if like two or three of them came out with books, but when you see every big YouTuber come out with a book, I just, it made me cringe more than when I watched Big Mouth. Ha ha ha, that's just a joke. I would never watch that show. The point being that Shane Dawson also hopped on this trend, but he didn't write just one book. No, he wrote two. That's right, Shane Dawson. Author of I Hate My Selfie and It Gets Worsey. It get, I, I meant it gets worse. Now, as I said before, I didn't like when all these big YouTubers came out with the books because there's just no way, there's no way that all of their lives were just so interesting that it had to become a book. Here's some footage of me reading these books. I'm having the time of my life, if that's not obvious. But what did I think of the books? Honestly? Not terrible. My expectations were so low that they held their own weight. Plus, I prefer this format over what I assume other YouTubers, how they write their books. If you're not familiar, these books are collections of short stories that happen in Shane's life. There are some decent jokes in there, but if you don't like Shane's humor, then there's no way you're gonna like the books. He made that abundantly clear in I Hate My Selfie when he talks about how much he hates the way he portrayed himself online before 2015. You can also tell when he's exaggerating in a story, but I'm glad he does do that because if he doesn't, then it would be boring to read. In It Gets Worse, the reoccurring theme is Shane's sexuality. This book came out at some point after Shane did. And just to put a cap on the whole Lauren saga, there is a chapter in there dedicated to her and explains why their working relationship had to end. I'll read a passage from it. After about 30 minutes of hugging and crying, she left. I sat on my couch and let it all sink in. Being on a reality show changed my life in more ways than I could have imagined. Not only did I finally see what I looked like from behind, not good, and I saw how I treated the people I was closest to when I was stressed and it was something I wanted to change. 
I never try to be mean, but when I'm in work mode, I have a habit of letting my passion explode out of my body like fireworks out of a cardboard tube. Losing Lauren made me realize it was time to change and time to start to get a handle on my emotions. The fight started because Lauren was rushing me through some thing because we were running out of time. Instead of understanding that she was trying to help me accomplish everything I wanted in the time allotted, I snapped at her and turned into World War III. Granted, she wasn't innocent either. There were probably much better ways for her to tell me to hurry up, but we were both in high stress environment. On the drive back to our apartment building in Pittsburgh, she cried while she explained to me how much it hurt that I yelled at her in front of everyone. I felt like complete shit at the time, but it wasn't until I watched it unfold on TV that I didn't just feel like shit, I felt like shit and throw up. Remember this, because I want you guys to keep track of his line of behavior. And there are more passages from the book that I'm going to reference, but once they match with what I'm talking about. I'll end this off by saying that the books are okay. I just think that the good stories are weighed down by the stories that I have no interest in reading in. So read the books, don't read the books. Doesn't matter to me. I'm also cutting the food segment as well. The big thing you need to know about this era is that as Shane was uh, making these food videos, this is where you would start to see his humor transition from offensive to self-deprecating. This change makes sense so that you're not pissing people off with the stereotypes and shock value and all that, but self-deprecating can be dangerous as well. You see, this type of humor has become glorified in our generation, but the issue is that subconsciously you can start actually believing the things that you're saying when you're self-deprecating yourself, thus harming your self-esteem. Since Shane does this kind of sense of humor, it's promoting to his young, impressionable fans to start doing the same, even if it's unintentional. We all need to start being more confident with ourselves. Just don't let it get into arrogance, because then that's a real issue. Alright. Let's start getting into some theories. Hey, what's up you guys? Yes, welcome back to another creepy video. Now in today's video, we're gonna be talking about something very, very intense and scary and very creepy. Eventually, Shane realizes, hey, wait a second, I don't wanna be known as just the food guy. So he started making content revolving around something that he's actually passionate about, which are conspiracy theories. Now this format was perfect for Shane. It combined two of his great loves, which is pop culture, and horror. Hey, do you like Animaniacs? Wow, well, what if I told you that they're actually creepy and scary? Whoa! Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure Shane was the one who popularized conspiracy theory videos. Yes, creators were already making creepy pasta videos and serial killer videos, but I believe conspiracy videos specifically became way more of a thing after Shane started doing them. Now, these videos were a nice change of pace from the other content that Shane was making. He doesn't try to be funny. His focus is solely on the subject matter. Also, these videos weren't getting as repetitive as the food videos were. The theories from video to video feel very diverse. Now let's skip ahead to 2017, which is where Shane decided to step away from making daily content. Both Alexis Giazal and Destry Smith stopped making videos for Shane and focused on their personal channels. This was a very pivotal point for Shane. This is where he starts to toy around with the type of content that would be in the same vein as the stuff you would see him make today. I adopted a child, confronting my dad, switching lives with Trisha Paytas. Even though his channel was going in this direction, Shane still felt like something was missing. This is why conspiracy videos returned, and in a bigger way. Branding has improved, the videos have gotten bigger, and they're no longer him just showing clips and reacting to them. And you know, that reacting would be something along the lines of, Ooh, that gave the chills. <sighs> I hate it. <laughs> Shane and company would go out exploring real life conspiracies to see if they have any merit. Shane made all the right calls here, especially since these conspiracy videos became even more mainstream than they already were. These video titles aren't even that interesting, and yet the views are entering music video territory. I mean, look at these two videos. They both literally have the same video title, and yet they're both over 30 million views. How? As for my personal opinion, I have either one or two different reactions when I'm watching these videos. Either I get the heebie-jeebies when Shane starts talking about stuff like FEMA camps and secret webcams hidden in hotels and Airbnbs. Or if the theories are just plain out ridiculous, and I just get upset on how much evidence there is to back them up. Now the downside of this sort of success is that the more eyes you have on you, the more critical people are going to get. These conspiracy videos are not meant to be taken seriously, they're, they're purely meant for entertainment. Like. The Chuck E. Cheese recycling pizza thing just got way out of hand. People like MadPat had to debunk this. 
all comes down to the pizza rocker that they use to cut the pieces. The blades are dull, and as a result, they wreck the pizzas more than a sharpened blade otherwise would. Ironically, it's a safety policy that Chuck E. Cheese has in place that's led to a conspiracy theory accusing them of serving unsafe pizza. Chuck E. Cheese Recycled Slices Conspiracy Theory is hereby declared 100% theorist certified false. But to be honest with you guys, I'm pretty sure MadPat resents Shane. Think about it. MadPat is supposed to be YouTube's theory guy, and yet Shane just comes out of nowhere and starts making these theory videos that are bigger and do way better. I know if I was MadPat, I'd be pissed when I saw that Shane had named one of his makeup colors just a theory. You know, the one thing that MadPat says at the end of every fucking video. Overall, I think the conspiracy videos are some of the best content that Shane's ever put out, and people shouldn't be taking them so seriously. You know, now I'm thinking about it, when Shane returns to YouTube, I'm willing to bet it's going to be with a conspiracy video. But if we want to go down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole for just a second, humor me here. What if the Illuminati was behind the cancellation of Shane Dawson? Shane would always talk about them in his videos, and he even made his makeup palette and merch using their brand. What if they finally said, enough is enough, it's time to finally destroy his career? I mean, that way, the majority of people online wouldn't take Shane so seriously anymore. Think about it. I want you to tell me why you did it, be honest about it, and change your life and fucking stop. Once Shane started making his conspiracy videos bigger and better, it set up the perfect foundation for a new genre that wasn't prevalent on the platform yet. We're talking about YouTube documentaries, and honestly, it's genius. This also showed everybody, including the algorithm, that the audience is willing to sit through content that is hours long. Speaking of which, thank you for watching this, everybody. The format for a Shane Dawson docuseries goes as follows. Shane will pick a creator who is either the face of controversy, who used to be predominant on the platform but fell from grace, or someone entirely new he's never heard of but is very fascinated by. Now for the sake of research, I only watched the four series that I thought were the most important. The Tanacon series, the first Jeffree Star series, the Jake Paul series, and the second Jeffree series. And for the sake of time, I'll try to get through this quickly, but it's, it's a lot, guys. Like, it's so much. It's also 5 in the morning, by the way. In 2018, the Tanacon series was the first to come in this bunch. These three videos really solidified Shane as a YouTube documentarian. Everyone loved this series so much. Shane actually ended up appearing on many podcasts this year, and the Tanacon series would be referenced at least once. In my opinion, I think the Tanacon series is the best one that Shane did. Now don't get me wrong, there's still plenty wrong with it, but it does well in many aspects. There are only three episodes, they're about half an hour each, and they're not overly complicated. Where I think Shane really screws up is when he starts cutting Tana some slack. Yes, he does throw a bunch of clips in there that make Tana look bad. I have it set at 5200 right now. I love that for us. So I feel like 5200 is a good number. It would be really, really cool to have people like outside waiting to get in. Like people love to be oppressed outside. Yeah. They're just like, I waited in the rain. Like they love that shit. Oh, I love that shit. But I'm talking about when he goes to interview her, his judgment is definitely clouded by his emotions. I know that he cares about her like she's his little sister, but you cannot let that stuff get to you. When you're watching a documentary on Netflix and the subject begins to cry, does the interviewer start to go easy on them? No. You have to leave your emotions at the door if you want to pull this off correctly. But here's where I'm conflicted. Would people like Jake Paul and Jeffree Star truly open up if they considered Shane this heartless, cold-blooded person? No way. It's because Shane sympathizes with people and tries to see the good in them that makes them feel comfortable and trust him. If somebody else would have done this better, I'm like, Michael and Tana wouldn't have done it. They right. did it because it's me and because they trust me. And I feel like this is an important detail because a lot of people who criticize Shane don't take that into consideration. To get back to the Tanacon series, it did look like Michael Weiss was the reason why everything fell apart. But he has finally released his Tanacon documentary on Amazon Prime. Now, I couldn't be bothered to sit through that, but YouTuber Def Noodles made a video about it, so I'm going to take his word for it. I want to want to head um, the creative. I'm kind of confused by this whole situation. Tana was just throwing her former business partner under the bus to Shane Dawson, but at the same time, she also had her ex-girlfriend as a business partner and creative director for her convention. That part, obviously, you're, you're gonna crush. I mean, I, there's things that I think 
would be really good, right? Wait, hold on. Tana's manager, Jordan Verona, was also involved in the production of TanaCon? Why were Jordan and Bella and their roles in TanaCon conveniently omitted from Shane Dawson's documentary? Maybe Shane just forgot to talk about it in the documentary. Sometimes it happens with super important details like that. Enter Jeffree Star. The first Jeffree series was okay. We get to see a look behind the curtain of Jeffree's life. We get to learn how Jeffree became so rich. And of course, Shane and Jeffree cry. Like, these things always end up in crying man like I, you know what i want to see shane dawson and markiplier cry together i think that'd be perfect they, i think they're both the crying boys of youtube to be honest i think the real issues come in the second jeffrey series but before we get into that let's take a look at the jake paul one real quick i remember being so excited for this docuseries to come out when it came to youtubers like tana mojo jeffrey star and graveyard girl I, I just didn't know these people beforehand so therefore i wasn't really excited to get into their series but i was very familiar with Jake Paul, so I was very excited to see how this series played out. After re-watching the series, I think Shane handled this one the worst. Let's break it down. So part 3 and segments of part 6 don't need to be there. The other segments of part 6 can go into part 5. Parts 1, 4, and 7 can all be cut down into one episode. Part 2 is just problematic with the way mental health was portrayed, and parts 5 and 8 are okay for the most part. Now as for part 2, I understand the criticisms of Katie Morton, but to be fair to her, her specialty is eating disorders and not sociopaths. I'm so scared. Wait, no, wait. What this is I not my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> I work with eating disorders and self-injury in my practice. Oh, uh, well, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I have heard that Katie has been copy-striking people who are being critical of her, so... I'm not going to defend her, but if we're looking at the series as a whole, there's just so much fluff and filler. I haven't seen a lot of legit docuseries, but the one I have seen is Tiger King, so I'm going to use that to compare it for a bit. With Tiger King, there's a new crazy thing happening in each episode. Joe Exotic running for governor, the mystery of the death of Carol Baskin's husband, uh, Joe Exotic going to court, etc. You also see the interviews being edited together, all to weave the narrative, and that's why I think parts 1 4 and 7 of the Jake series can all be one episode, or either that or edited throughout the series. Also, Joe Exotic is there from episode 1, and in the Jake series, you don't see him until part 5. And not to mention, as crazy as Tiger King was, it was only 7 episodes in the Jake series, it was 8. I did want to mention that in part 8, Shane did not press hard enough on Jake like he said he would. He was so ill prepared. By the end of the series, I wanted to grab both Shane and Jake's heads and bonk them together like coconuts. But the big issue with Jake, Tana, and Jeffrey was that they were all made to look like good people, which would have been fine had they stuck with that after their series ended. But that didn't happen. They all continued to be shitty and the faces of controversy. If I was Shane, I would have been infuriated with them. He went out of his way. He stuck his neck out for these people. And what do they do in return? In a few months, uh, they're just back to their old selves. Now this leads us to the second Jeffrey series. Shane and Jeffrey team up to make the Shane Dawson palette. I did notice that a big theme of this series is Shane trying to gain some confidence. I mean, he lays that on pretty thick when he chooses a song that's like, And I'll never be the prom queen. Ooh. Cause I wanna be somebody to serve. But I will admit, I was very fascinated by this series, just because I am someone who knows nothing about makeup so it was very interesting to see that makeup really is like gold to people where i think this series fails well i think it happens for two big reasons one shane should have never included the james charles drama in the trailer i mean that's what a lot of people were most excited for you can't change your mind like that and expect people to be happy that you clickbaited them that hard shane thinks that he makes it up to us by showing a little bit of it in the last episode but it really doesn't do much the second big failure is when Shane is sad that he's not as rich as he could be. The perception is that you do have fucking money. No. Oh I would my god. You have like fucking fuck you. I thought no. it was at least worth 20 mil. Like, what? I really, I what? really thought that. Easily. Great. I, did you okay. think that? I thought you were. What? I thought, I don't, I didn't 20 think 20 million dollars? Yes. 
10 million? Oh, no. Even back in the day, my overhead was 100,000 bucks when I was doing like short films and sketches and shit. And I had a producer, I had you know my mom's mortgage, my brother, like all these people. So I would make what yeah. I'd spent, yeah. a bad business move. And I did that for years. I had a, a falling out with the people when we were all you know in the room trying to make this thing happen. Uh, something happened, I didn't like it. I didn't like where their heads were at. There was weird shit going on and I was just like, I'm gonna go, but in a nice way, I'm gonna go. And then they were really no. mean and I was like, well, fuck you and keep your equity and I left. I understand that he's been screwed over a lot throughout his career, but you cannot be as big as Shane is on YouTube and not have at least 1 million in the bank. And for anyone in the audience who's not familiar, if you're a YouTuber who has in the range of 100K subscribers to a million, then you most likely are making up enough money to survive and have YouTube as your full-time job. But if you have a channel that has over 20 million subscribers, you cannot sit there and tell me that you're not a millionaire. So when Shane Dawson is crying on the bathroom floor just because he's not as rich as Jeffree Star, it just comes off as super disingenuous. Like, hello, that's such a ridiculous standard to compare yourself to. That would be like if a small creator like me were to go like, oh, what's the point of making videos, man? Like, if they're not gonna do as well as a PewDiePie video, for example, then what's the point? I mean, he's number one and I'm all the way at the bottom of the food chain, so well, what the fuck? Why can't I do as well as PewDiePie? Ugh. There are only a handful of people on the internet who are as rich as Jeffrey. Like, we know what your house looks like, dude. If Shane was living in a two-bedroom apartment and had to come home after spending an entire day at Jeffrey's mansion, then oh yeah, I think that feeling of uh, being poor is totally warranted. I, it's understandable. But that's not the case. Shane and Ryland's home is huge with a lot of outdoor space in California. Shane, you just have to realize how that makes you look. Ooh. Got him. There are other issues, but I'll just leave it at that. If you want to see actually decent YouTube documentaries, then check out the two that iDubs made. Say what you will, but they're not eight episodes. They're, you know, just one and both like about an hour. Well, there you go. That is Shane Dawson's career broken down in 30 to 45 minutes. Now that we all have a good understanding of Shane as a creator, I think it's about time that we start to invade the skeletons in his closet. And you might want to close your eyes for the second half because it's going to get ugly. Have you watched this one? Uh, oh yeah, this is the episode where something cringy happens. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just on the phone with a stupid salesman. We need to talk. Oh, I'm just joshing, man. Obviously it's a good show, but the fan base ruins it. I'm not talking about that. What's happening with you lately? What do you mean? There's been too many instances where we're just having a normal conversation or we're hanging out with friends and you just turn into a different person. Give me an example. Okay, remember two weeks ago at Dominic's party? That wasn't really much of a party. It was more of a social distance gathering. There was only like eight of us. The point being is that we're all having fun and we're all having a great time. Until, until, you, until you explode out of one. He got up on his face for no reason. We all thought you were gonna fight. I don't remember that. What? I recall the fun, the dancing, and even the drinking. I was probably just wasted. No, no, no. I've seen you drunk many times. You turned into a showman. Jim Carrey in comparison. That was not you drunk. I don't know what you want me to say. I have no memory of that. Well, that wasn't the only time. I'm starting to lose track of how many times you let, you got angry with me for no apparent reason. Mm -hmm. What was that? I'm just trying to ease the tension. I'm sensing a lot of hostility in the air. You're just dodging responsibility right now. You're not taking anything I'm saying seriously. Can you just admit that what I'm saying has any merit? What are you waiting for? Give it to me. Don't even think about it. He's the reason we're in this predicament in the first place. Oh, here we go again. Yes, here we go again. Your actions keep getting us pinned to the ground. Obviously, I'm gonna complain about that. I know what I'm doing. This is gonna work out for us in the long run. 
I just don't believe you, and I hate the way that you make us treat people. Dude, who cares? When are you gonna realize that other people don't matter? What I'm looking out for is number one, and that is us. Give it to me. I'm the one who has our best interests at heart. No, he doesn't. All he cares about is peace, love, and chicken nuggets for some reason. Can you sit there and honestly say that you like the way that he talks to people? Oh, please. People like being treated like dirt. If you're too squeaky clean and nice, people are going to think you're boring and stale. Where do you think the stereotype of girls going after the bad boys stem from? Trust me. Please, do what's right. Good choice. This is insane. Can you just admit that what I'm saying has any merit? Oh, look at this time, I gotta get ready. Hey, wait a minute, we're not done talking about this. Well, I'm done talking about this. How was that so quick? Look man, just don't worry about me, okay? I can take care of myself. This is what I'm talking about, why are you speaking to me like this? Who are you, man? Can you just shut up already? I have that thing I'm supposed to do tonight, remember? I can't be late, I gotta go. Hey! Because of your actions, you're gonna make a lot of enemies. And if you walk out that door, you're gonna consider me on that list too. Yada yada, blah blah, vague threat, vague threat. Wait, what? The car needs some gas. Can you go by the nearby gas station and put some gas in it? Okay. Too far gone. If we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this tonight before I change my mind. He's heading right now to the gas station nearby. Follow him. I'll be getting ready. I feel like I'm with the mob boss. It's like a mafia. What? I don't know. That's another thing I want to know. It's crazy, like, even in the car, it was like, ready for me. It's like, no, it's like, okay. I mean, it was really like, whispering. Before we continue, I did have a disclaimer that I wanted to put out there. There are going to be times in this half of the video where it sounds like I'm trying to justify or defend Shane's actions. That's not what I'm trying to do. Let me put it like this. When a detective is trying to catch a killer, or any criminal in general, the detective has to figure out uh, the individual's motivation. What has to go through a person's mind that would drive them to do this? Understanding the mindset, that's what I want to do. And I may have to repeat that a few times because I just know that there are going to be some people watching this that will be claiming, What was that? Was that a justification? Are you trying to defend him? Now, if you're familiar with Shane's controversies, you'd know that nearly all of them happened several years ago. So why now? Why did all of this come out and successfully cancel him this year? Well, after many years of upsetting a bunch of people and making a lot of enemies, he finally pissed off the wrong people. Let's rewind a bit. It all started when Shane decided to associate himself with the villain of the makeup world, Jeffree Star. Jeffree had appeared on the Shane and Friends podcast, and they also made a video together on Jeffree's channel, but they didn't officially become friends until the first Jeffree series. Now, I already talked about the series earlier, but what I didn't mention was that in episode 4, they actually foreshadowed the second Jeffree series. I actually think this could be interesting because we could make this palette, okay. and we could document the process of coming up with the ideas, making the actual palette, making the marketing, doing like commercial. No like, one oh, ever, campaigns. okay, so no one has ever shown the real behind the scenes of how to create a product yes. from zero to an idea on a piece of paper to it's in your hand ready to be shipped. No one's ever done that. This brings us to 2019, where Shane and Jeffrey spend the majority of their energy creating the conspiracy palette and working on the second series. Now Shane actually finds out pretty on from Jeffrey that the beauty world is uh, very cutthroat. Beauty people will tear each other down, they'll steal from one another, and they'll just flat out ruin your career if you cross them. Honestly, I think it's hilarious that people assume that the commentary community are the bad guys of the platform. Sure, we make content revolving around criticizing and exposing other creators, but beauty people are out for blood. And that became pretty clear to the audience at large when two YouTubers faced off. They went painted toe to painted toe. 
That was supposed to be a painted toenail joke. I'm talking about Tati Westbrook and James Charles. In June of 2019, Tati released a video called Bye Sister, which was a 40 minute long expose on James. In it, Tati explains that she's upset with James because he did an ad for one of her competitors for their vitamins and not hers. Oh, the problems of the 1%. I just, I just, I don't know how they do it. I mean, the betrayal. I mean, it, they have it so bad. Now, James did this because he sort of blindly said yes to it without really thinking about it and couldn't back out. Also, let's not forget, James was very loyal to Tati, always supporting her products, and honestly, he was one of her biggest cheerleaders. Tell me you're the nicest person you've ever met. No one. <laughs> <laughs> the nicest? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Tati. Yes. And really genuine, like, no... Just one of the best first people I've ever met. As real as they come. Wow. 100%. Okay. What about in the regular YouTube community? Mm -hmm. Shane, one of the best people I've ever met. Yeah. But Tati saw an opportunity and couldn't resist. Bye Sister shook the community like nothing else. I believe it garnered over 50 million views at one point. It even inspired other creators to also create huge expose videos on creators that they were associated with, especially to those who have tendencies of sloppily following any huge trends. But why did Bye Sister become such a huge deal? What did Tati say about James? Well, the biggest controversy to come out of it was Tati accused James of using his fame and power to target straight men and overall being a predator. Oh my god, you tried to trick a straight man into thinking he's gay yet again and somehow you're the victim. This didn't sit right with the community. The cancellation of James Charles began. James lost millions of subscribers and the respect of the internet. Meanwhile, Tati doubles her subscriber count, going from 5 million to 10. Also, it's very important to note that Jeffree Star came out backing up Tati. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, Shane placed his James drama in the trailer for the second series. All of this sends James down a spiral. He was getting hate everywhere and nearly drove himself to suicide. I'm helpful to my best friends, especially the ones that were with me in Australia that kept me from making a really, really dangerous, irreversible choice that I would not have been able to take back. But here's where things get interesting. You see, a couple of creators started to smell foul play. There, there were just some things in Bi Sister that just weren't adding up. Eventually, James cleans up that running mascara, hikes up that skirt of his, and makes his official 40-minute response video called No More Lies. Oh, that's right. He came in with the receipts. That's from Five Guys. In his response, James is able to eloquently debunk nearly all of Tati's claims. Even the waiter that Tati references in Bye Sister came out and made a video saying that he is indeed bi curious and that he wanted to hook up with James. We ended up watching a movie, and after that movie, he asked to kiss me. And I was very nervous because I had never done anything with a guy and I was bi curious, so. I said yes. We ended up making out for around an hour, and if I'm being honest, he's the worst kisser I've ever kissed. Way too much tongue. This was the turning point. The internet realizes they fucked up, and they shouldn't have been so quick to listen and totally believe everything that Tati had said initially. This put James's channel back on track for growth, and Tati's channel spends the next year losing a million subscribers. But before we can move on, I'm not gonna let James off the hook so easily. You see, I don't think James is a predator, but I do think that there were shades of truth that he targets straight men. On July 13th of 2019, I was at VidCon in Anaheim, California. At my Airbnb, I would swipe on Bumble, to find someone to play checkers with. And guess who shows up on my feed? This is a real screenshot from my phone. That's right, James would go by as a woman on dating apps so that he could match with straight guys. Again, this is 100% real. I would not risk my credibility as a commentator for something like this. As you can see, that is the date that the screenshot took place. Also keep in mind that I had no plans of making commentary videos at this point. Now for the naysayers who are thinking, oh, well, that could just be someone pretending to be James, you know? Uh, plenty of people pretend to be YouTubers to catfish on those platforms. Normally I'd agree with you, but if you take a look at the name, right next to it is a blue check mark, which I'm sure as you can guess, that means it's a verified account. So that's for sure the real James Charles. Hey sister. Also, let's not forget that I stumbled onto his Bumble merely a month after his cancellation. I know that if I was being accused of what he did, then I would have definitely have changed my gender back to my actual one. But don't just take my word for it. Recently I heard a story from a gaming channel called Super Mega that was eerily similar to mine. Did I ever tell you Carson found him on Tinder? Yeah, Carson, on, on as, as a woman. As a woman, yeah. He and still does that, by the way. Carson was Someone swiping on Tinder and he found James him. Charles in uh, as a female. 
and he knew that it was James. I, I saw it with my own eyes. It was verified. Did he put it had on a wig? It had, no, it was just very, it was regular James, James Charles. Charles, but it was verified. It had the check mark next to the name, so it was really him. Huh? How about that? Whoa, whoa, wait. Now let's hear their impression of James. It, it cracks me up every time. Hey, sisters. I wish fall. James Charles had a massive lisp. Same talk here, ah, new <laughs> It's also important to know that that video those clips came from was uploaded two months ago, so James is very recently up to these shenanigans. So let's cut to 2020 from here, a year after the cancellation of James Charles. What if there was more to the story that nobody knew? Could it be that Tati Westbrook wasn't the only player behind the Bi Sister video? Are there figures behind the curtain controlling Tati like their little Puppet. Also, there were a few creators who were supporting this theory. The truth is, is that someone, and right now, I legally can't say who, um, told us a few things. And we trusted that person's opinion. And then another person said some things that was friends with that man. And it really convinced us that he was a predator. If you want, we can pause and I can go in another room and play Banks, what I have on my phone, and he can determine if he would have sent the same tweet. At the end of the day, I'm not gonna out a victim of James Charles. I remember there was this instance where he's like, asked me if I like James or not. And I was like, I don't like, I don't have a problem with him. Do I agree with everything he does? No but I don't have a pro personal problem with him and he's done so much for me, so why would I go against him? And he was like, well, you don't fucking owe him forever. And I remember Shane Dawson called and he was going off about James Charles and something and telling like, just like cursing James out. And I was just like, kind of took taken back because I've never seen Shane Dawson like that. And he was just going in on James. And I was like, oh, is there like, some, there, there's something like brewing. There's something going on with James and Shane and Jeffrey. He said, Shane and I feel like this weekend something bad is going to happen with all of this. James is playing with so much fire right now. Why does Shane and you feel like that? What is Shane's involvement? Shane had no reason to really be involved in this. All fingers were starting to point at Shane and Jeffrey. Shane decided to put out a statement because of the situation and also used it as a way to say goodbye to the beauty community. To sum it up, Shane says that James Charles needed to be taken down a notch and he also condemned beauty gurus. I mean, this statement is so over the top. When he first tweeted about this, I remember skimming through it because I really didn't care. But after reading it for this video, I totally understand why so many people were pissed off at it. I mean, Shane gives Jeffrey, a person who is arguably worse than James, a pass, and oh, but James is the one who needs a slice of humble pie. Okay, guy. And I get why Shane defends Jeffrey, it's because they've grown very close, and not to mention Jeffrey helped Shane make 10 million fucking dollars. Shane, you cannot put out these biases and expect people to just be cool with that. Or an even better idea, just don't make a statement at all. Stop doing these impulsive things, they just get you in so much trouble. I think what resonated the most to the public with the statement is when Shane says that he knew that Tati was thinking of making Bi Sister, but he chose not to warn James. I think the big issue is that Shane refuses to provide further context. In the statement, he says that he'll never reveal the reasons why. So because it's left up in the air, obviously people are going to speculate. And Jeffrey actually does a similar thing in Mom's Basement. In the episode, he says that he has an audio clip that convinced him that James is a predator, but he'll never make it public. Both Shane and Jeffrey relied too heavily on the audience just taking their word for it. But as we all know, that's not good enough. Do you think James's No More Lies video would have been as effective as it was if he didn't provide proof on screen? No way, James had to make sure that it was not left up for interpretation, that a lot of what Tati had said about him was untrue. Even in both of Tati's videos, Bye Sister and Breaking My Silence, she just sits there and talks and talks and talks, but doesn't provide any legitimate proof that we could see on screen. We just have to trust what she's saying, which we won't. So since Tati, Shane, and Jeffrey couldn't provide any receipts, it was over for them. Also, I wanted to mention number seven on Shane's statement, that was just a complete lie. You absolutely have a track record of getting into drama with people. You had Janet McCurdy on your podcast seven years ago, and you two had previous drama because of a dumb, impulsive decision that you made. 
Sound familiar? I went on Twitter and what the buck, who is, you know, a YouTuber uh, or still is a YouTuber, was like, oh my God, Jeanette McCurdy just unfollowed me. And I was like, ooh, drama, what's going on? And then you tweeted something like, sorry, I just had to unfollow you because you cuss sometimes in your tweets and I didn't want my audience to see that, which is understandable. Of course, me, this is hilarious. I okay. went nuts. I was like, <laughs> what? Oh, is she saying that YouTubers are like dirty and nasty? Wait, where did you go nuts? On a video or on Twitter? In real life. So then I go on Twitter and I just start ranting. I'm like, oh, Jeanette, you think you're so clean and so perfect and so Christian, which by the way, I don't think you ever said you were a Christian. No. I just assumed it. I'm like, you're just so religious. And I'm like, you know, I can't wait. And, you know, I bet in three years you're going to, you know, have a, a baby and be in rehab. And I just went nuts. And you were just like, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean it like that. And like, wow, that was mean. And I'm sorry. And then when you saw it, it literally was my biggest reality check of my life of like, oh, people see shit. And oh, like when I say something, they might see it. And yeah. I was crying and I felt horrible. And I like tweeted you too many times apologizing. And you were like, it's okay, girl, it's fine. <laughs> there are also other examples of this behavior, but we'll get to that. Now in the rest of Shane's statement, he says goodbye to the beauty community and tells all the gurus to go fuck themselves. Ha ha. This was his most fatal mistake. This is where the snowball effect truly starts. Thus beginning the cancellation of Shane Dawson. Right now is very much a time of wanting people to be accountable, wanting uh, punishment for people, and I agree. And that's why I'm making this video. After Shane found himself in the crosshairs, the internet exploded. Beauty gurus were going after Shane, the audience was going after Shane, many people were just looking for any old pictures and old videos that'll not make him look good. Hell, some clips got so mainstream that it got the attention of celebrities. Things were getting way out of control, so on June 26th of 2020, Shane Dawson released a video called Taking Accountability. In the 20 minute video, Shane profusely apologizes for everything that he's ever done and accepts full responsibility. He also admits that his past apology videos were awful, and he's learned a lot since then. Now this video has quite a few different problems. It's not that effective because he only mentions a few of the controversial clips. You need to talk about everything, which is unfortunate for you because the amount of stuff that's coming out, it's in the hundreds. Also, you should have done more of what Jenna Marbles did when she left the platform. Jenna doesn't make any excuses, and she exposes herself with the problematic content that she has made in the past. If I ever offended you by posting this video, or by doing this impression, and that that was never my intention, it's not okay, it's shameful, it's awful, I wish it wasn't part of my past. The thing with Shane is that he always explains the reasoning behind the things he does, which normally would be fine, but the way he does it, it makes them sound like justifications. So people typically think that he's trying to play the victim, which is why people don't respond well to this. But to be honest, YouTuber apology videos are rarely ever good slash effective. What I find the most interesting is that Shane says that he's actually willing to lose everything. At this point, realizing how many people I've hurt or how many people I've inspired to say awful things or, or do anything awful, like to finally just own up to all of this and be accountable is worth losing everything to me. I don't think I've ever heard someone of his level of success say something like this. But of course, one could make the argument that it doesn't mean anything, it's just a blanket statement because it's not a realistic thing to happen. Regardless, the video ended up coming out and Shane was able to save his career for a little bit. But on June 30th, merely four days later, Tati Westbrook came out with a video called Breaking My Silence. You see, now that the internet was convinced that Shane and Jeffrey were involved in canceling James, Tati of course just couldn't once again miss out on such an opportunity and spent the video throwing Shane and Jeffrey under the bus. I got a heart attack. <laughs> To be completely honest with you, the video is just horseshit. Until today, I made no comment, and I have made every effort to move through this with dignity. The reality is, every day I've struggled quietly trying to rebuild my now poisoned reputation. Fuck, I fell asleep for a second there. You can't go from, yes James, you're a predator, even though I'm lying and exaggerating just to spread a false narrative, to, oh yes, the truth finally comes crawling out. It was all Shane and Jeffrey. D don't blame me. They made me do it. Attack them. 
After the lies of Bi Sister, she loses all credibility, so forgive me for not jumping immediately to trusting what she says. Now, had she come out with this right after James's No More Lies video, then yeah, it would have had been a bit more effective and she would have had more stock in it. Not wait until the internet came up with this conclusion and then you just went along with it just because. As far as I'm concerned, Tati is solely responsible for this video. Sending James down a dark path and also shifting blame onto someone else, I mean, that's just scummy. And look, I don't want to make this an age thing, but Tati, you were 37 when you made Bi Sister. I mean, come on. You, you are literally the oldest out of all of the four players. You should technically be the most mature, the most grounded, and of course, the most humble. Sure, it's possible that you are influenced by people who are more successful than you, but I mean, you should just know better. I mean, oh, where are your morals? I'm looking around, where are they? Looking at all the evidence, I think that Tati is the one to blame and she dug her own grave. But with all that being said, as I mentioned earlier, Shane was being attacked by every corner. So once he saw that Breaking My Silence was uploaded, I mean, that was it. That was the final straw, man. In true Shane Dawson nature, he impulsively turned on Instagram Live and showed the public the meltdown that he was currently having. So how is it that so many editorial outlets knew that something was coming before I had- Because you mess in drama channels! Oh my god. Oh my god. As a victim of abuse myself- Sh Oh my god. Terrifying. You are so manipulative. To think of facing public- You're fake- you're fake crying. You are fake crying! You are fake crying! That is not real! Oh my god! Now his anger is warranted, don't get me wrong. However, people are still mad at you at this point. So, them seeing you angry like this, it's gonna further cement their current opinion on you. You see, he's not really sorry. Look how upset he is. Let's keep canceling him. Yeah! It's like when you're playing Among Us and somebody gets over the top angry when being accused. To everyone else, that person is coming in with way too much heat and talking way too much. There's, there's just no way of not looking guilty. This was the last thing Shane said about the situation. After that, he left the internet for many months, thus further cementing his cancellation. Like I said, this was such a big deal for the online community. I mean, it's not like every day a YouTube titan like Shane Dawson falls. Here's a handful of examples of how people reacted. <laughs> Public enemy number one, Shane Dawson. I'm going to show you how Shane Dawson from the past and Shane Dawson from the present are two different people. Not because he's changed or grown, as he'd have you believe, but because the Shane Dawson that we're seeing today is a mask. And lately, that mask has been slipping. The difficulty here is that an apology needs to be sincere. Sincere is a specified range, and we can see insincerity expressed in a variety of ways around that. If he did not accept enough responsibility, that could be viewed as insincere. Similarly, if he accepts too much responsibility, that can seem insincere as well. It's almost like this video had a self-hatred feel to it. Shane Dawson, crazy stuff going on. You think he should be forgiven for what he said and stuff like that? I don't want like to that? talk about anything in relation to him. I know. Well, by doing blackface and making tons of pedophilic jokes, Shane Dawson definitely end ended his, his career. career. I mean, he didn't Is like that your final dinner. answer? Shane Dawson ended his f***ing career that's, hardcore. But that's like he was involving actual kids in these pedophile, pedophile jokes. Like, I'm sorry, but it's not a joke. Uh, that's the one thing I've been considering in my mind. I have a niece. Um, she's in middle school. All of her friends watch, right. you know, all these YouTube videos and stuff. And like... If she were to, like, if anybody did anything like that to her, I'd fucking, I'd lose it. This is probably the most conflicted I've ever felt about making a video. I want to talk about the Shane situation, but it's scary uh, for a couple of reasons. For one, he has a very big audience and a fan base that's pretty ready to defend him at every corner or so. And two, I don't think Shane is a monster. I, I really don't. By all accounts from both his friends and even mutual friends of ours, he's a well-meaning guy. Out of the three, out of Tati, Jeffrey, and Shane, Shane is the best actor out of all of them. There are gonna be points in his apology where he says things that have been directly contradicted and shown to be wrong. And during that time, there's not really any non-verbal tell to show that, to show misalignment, to show any sort of mental acrobatics with that sort of situation that you would expect to see in somebody who is being deceitful. Shane Dawson is a pedophile. Okay, so for legal reasons, I do have to say that that last one wasn't real. I just wanted to do a little corpse husband impression. 
Sorry. I also wanted to highlight some of the statements that were made on other social media platforms. Lisa Schwartz hasn't returned to her channel. Here's her statement on Twitter. To this day, she's only active on Instagram. Jesse Buttafuoco said this on Instagram, hating the bad things she said and condone on the Shane and Friends podcast and apologize to everyone that she had hurt. Brittany Louise Taylor told a story of when Shane bought an iPad for someone who couldn't afford it. But that didn't really do anything because with everything that has come up about Shane, that one story doesn't automatically make everything okay. Joey Graceffa made a statement about a video that resurfaced where Joey puts makeup on Shane that it was way too dark, making it look like blackface. Garrett Watts didn't really have a statement, but this is about as close as we'll get to one from him. Anyone else I didn't mention, like Drew Monson, Alexis Giazal, Dustry Smith, and Andrew Sawicki haven't said anything about the situation, and I doubt they ever will. Not that they necessarily have to, and plus, they might have impulsed said something the day it happened but then deleted it afterwards who knows I'm, I'm not a miracle worker okay i also looked around for a statement from bobby burns but instead he did me one better and i have now seen his penis again not a joke just look at his twitter where he constantly plugs his only fans he just openly posts his dick on there man god you know when i signed up to do this video i didn't ask to see shane dawson's penis i didn't ask to see bobby burns's penis just no more please i'm begging you not another penis if i see another one i'm gonna I'm gonna flip out. Okay, maybe not. With all that being said, even though I don't like cancel culture, I do agree that uh, Shane's sins need to be brought up and discussed. So, without further ado, let's get into it. I grew up in a household where there was a line. I mean, it was aggressive, and the jokes were crazy. It was Offensive. We can all agree that Shane's YouTube career started with humor that was shitty, offensive, and that only kids would watch for the most part. I wanted to spend some time exploring where Shane got his sense of humor, because subjectively it's just not well done. It's, it's no wonder in recent years he doesn't rely on his comedy for his content. Shane's old sense of humor is like if Laffy Taffy put more mature jokes in their candy wrappers. Just not a lot of effort. Now Shane has admitted in the past that his sense of humor came from his family because these were the type of things they would say in front of him as he was growing up. When I was a kid and I grew up in a household where there was no line. I mean it was aggressive, it, the jokes were crazy, it was offensive and I'm not saying it's good. I wouldn't raise my kids that way, especially now, but that's where I came from, right? So when I started YouTube, and I started saying jokes and I started saying things with my friends and stuff. I didn't know it was too far. I didn't know where the line was. And I quickly realized and it kind of fucked uh, my life up. <laughs> and on top of that, I'm sure Shane would watch shows like The Simpsons, Family Guy, South Park, you know, the kings of offensive and shock humor. So combining all of that, I mean, of course Shane wouldn't think that that kind of humor would hurt anybody on the internet. But the issue is with those TV shows that I mentioned, you know, they have teams that they picked out because they wanted the best who were educated when it comes to writing and comedy. For the most part, those people know how to handle humor and know where the line is. I mean, just look at Edgar Wright as a filmmaker. His editing is incredible and goes hand in hand with his comedic sense of timing. It's masterfully done. Shane explains in one of his books why he does this offensive humor. I don't ever make jokes that are hateful for no reason. If one of my characters say something completely over the line and offensive, the audience isn't meant to be laughing with them. They are meant to be laughing at them. Laughing at how stupid the character is for just saying something horrible, because there are people in this world who say horrible stupid shit. Instead of just sitting back and taking it, I like to make fun of them. That does make sense, plenty of people have used that style of comedy in their content, but in order for it to be effective, the straight man character has to make it abundantly clear to the wacky character that what they're doing and saying is completely wrong. But the straight man in Shane's videos didn't really do that. They were more of a representation of the audience and allowed the wacky character to do whatever they wanted. Let's use Seinfeld as an example. Throughout the series, the four leads would intentionally do many shitty things. The reoccurring joke with the show is that they're obviously not good people. But the reason it works for Seinfeld is that at the end of almost every episode, the character who does the bad thing gets what they deserve, you know, their comeuppance. With Shane, his offensive characters typically didn't get their comeuppance, thus subconsciously showing the audience that you can get away with doing shocking things and not get punished for it. But for Shane, that feels like it's something that he may never understand. I loved the feeling of making somebody shocked and laugh because they couldn't believe what was coming out of my mouth. I wasn't confident enough to make smarter jokes. I was making the easy jokes. I was playing crazy stereotypical characters. I was doing shit that was racially insensitive. I was doing shit that was homophobic. I was doing shit that could be 
considered fat shaming. I was doing some fucked up like comedy stuff that I'm not proud of. You know, he didn't study these things. He dropped out of college before he even gave himself the chance to study film and study comedy. Shane would say anything and everything, no matter how bad, just to get a laugh. And you know, that's just not good. You know, I compare Shane's early career to the rise of the Paul brothers, more specifically Logan Paul. In 2017, Logan went from 2 million to 10. Everything he was doing was a success. The world is his oyster and he just couldn't lose until his fatal mistake at the very end of the year in the Japanese forest. Before Shane and James Charles, this is the biggest cancellation a YouTuber ever experienced. And that is because he was surrounded by yes men, no one ever told him to stop and really consider what you're doing because he was getting dumb left and right. I think the same thing happened with Shane. No one ever told him to stop that sort of humor. No one told Shane to do some critical thinking of the things he's put out online. And he must have been receiving continuous validation from his kid audience. Thus encouraging Shane to continue without realizing he's not growing as a person and also making content that is harmful. Like to people of color. Before I say anything, I want to say, Shane, you my nigga, man. I told you I'm allowed to say it! Was that with an A at the end? That was with an A, right? Okay. Not Check. all of your fans are little girls, alright? Nobody likes a racist. At least, nobody with common sense likes a racist. You know, after seeing all the blackface and all the times he said the N-word and who could forget, uh, just all the stereotypes he's done, it makes me feel like he didn't grow up with a bunch of minorities around him, so... I wanted to test that theory, so I did some digging. Shane Dawson grew up in Long Beach, California and attended Lakewood High School. With that in mind, I used the US Census in 2010 in order to better understand the Long Beach population race-wise. Now, I can't speak on how it is now in 2020, but 10 years ago, Long Beach was low-key segregated. Although, I think that's just an issue in many towns across the country because of our class system. The four big races in Long Beach are white, black, Hispanic, and Asian. Here's the population broken down in a pie chart. Here's also the US Census in the year 2000. And as you can see by the percentages, not much has changed in 10 years. Now to get more specific, here are four different maps of Long Beach breaking down where each ethnicity lives. As you can see, for the most part, all of the white people live on the right side of Long Beach and all the people of color live on the left. But I still had to find out and make an educated guess on where he grew up. So knowing he went to Lakewood High School, I wouldn't be reaching to assume you attend the public high school you live closest to. After locating where Lakewood is on Google Maps, it's roughly around this vicinity, confirming he grew up in the white area of Long Beach. And just to further my point, a YouTuber by the name of Timothy Shantarangsu, or Delegato, also grew up in Long Beach. But he actually attended Paramount High School, which is roughly in this area. And what do you know? It's on the people of color side. Again, this is all to say that Shane didn't grow up with a lot of minorities in his life. To use me for an example, I grew up in an area that had a healthy mix of white, black, and Latinos. Getting to be surrounded by all sorts of different people is a privilege in my opinion. But let's get back to blackface, shall we? Now Shane would do this in videos in order to play celebrities like Nicki Minaj or just a character he came up with that's supposed to be black. What I'm about to say is going to sound obvious, but I promise it's leading somewhere. Blackface should be condemned, and I mean all of it. There are two things that I truly don't understand why they're still a thing, and that is blackface and the Confederate flag. Both having origins from hundreds of years ago, and yet to this day there are still some people who still think, I don't see the big deal. It's astounding the amount of celebrities and politicians that have actually done blackface at some point in their lives. I mean, it's bad enough people I admire like Ted Danson, Tom Hanks, and Robert Downey Jr. But I gotta tell you, what pushed me over the line was Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. I mean, is there no limit? Oh, what's next? Is SpongeBob gonna do blackface next? Next! Hey, 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 hey. Looks like you two took my advice. Nice job, gentlemen. I don't want to do this anymore. Here's something else that'll blow your mind. Not only was blackface started by white people in order to feel superior, but also at one point black people had to do blackface when performing. Why on earth would a black performer 
put on blackface and demean him or herself. They were, they, look, this is the 19th century. They had limited options. They were expected to. And on top of that, blackface happens in other parts of the world, specifically during Dutch holidays. Here's a clip of the Prime Minister merely a few years ago justifying a character they have by the name of Black Pete. Because what I said is that Black Pete is black, and I cannot change that, and uh, because the name is Black Pete. This is a uh, old children's tradition, Sinterklaas and Swart Pete, Black Pete. Uh, and it is not green peat or brown peat, it is black peat, so I cannot change that. Yes, Shane Dawson has done blackface many times, but at least he got the common sense to stop it at one point. To this day, the Dutch are still going through a process of getting rid of black peat. It's insane. The Dutch people who think this is wrong, that a tradition is being taken away from them, and sending death threats to the people who are making this change. Honestly, doesn't sound that far off from the US. Now, I came into this wanting to condemn all blackface. Seeing Shane Dawson do it, when you see celebrities do it, even in sitcoms like The Office, 30 Rock, It's Always Sunny, Seinfeld, Friends, and Community, all of it. None of it is okay. But then I remembered a movie called Tropic Thunder. This is the film where Robert Downey Jr. plays a character who is this pretentious actor who does blackface for a role. For those who don't know, the point of this movie is to shine a light on the hypocrisy of Hollywood and make fun of actors who go method and go to ridiculous levels for their roles. It does a great job of doing so. Tropic Thunder is very well done. Although, apparently next year a movie called All Star Weekend is coming out where RDJ plays a Mexican character. So we'll see if he can pull off that magic again. But this is where I'm stuck. Is Tropic Thunder truly the only blackface anomaly? Honestly, it's not my place to say. We all have a different moral compass. In the case of Shane Dawson, he just does it disgracefully. There is no nuance. He isn't professional and he doesn't treat it with care. I assume Shane has seen stuff like Tropic Thunder or any of the sitcoms and thought to himself, well, if they do it on TV, then surely I could do it on the internet. Also, let's not forget, since Shane's audience was mostly kids, who knows how many of these children have learned a similar lesson from him? Well, if Shane Dawson can do blackface, then I can too, right? One last point, even if it's for Halloween, that still doesn't make blackface okay. Blackface was designed to put black people down, and it will never shake that reputation. Shane did apologize for this in 2014, but that also was done poorly. It's pretty clear he just doesn't understand the gravity of what he was doing and how much power he carries as a huge social media influence. Influencer. As for all the times he or anyone in this video said the n-word, th there's just no excuse. It doesn't matter if he was playing a character or, and the point is that it's shocking that they would use that word, whoa. The execution is just done terribly and don't get the point across. Now it may seem like I'm going easy on Shane with this whole racism thing, but don't you worry because the next two points I'm bringing up really make my blood boil. You see, there's a story from his second book, It Gets Worse, where he and Lisa accidentally cross the Mexican border and have to somehow find their way back. They're asked to be pulled over, move over to the re-entrance side, and wait to be talked to. An officer walks up to their car. He is, of course, intimidating. Shane and Lisa explain what happened. The officer tells them to hold on for a second, and then he walks away. Shane says that there might be weed in the car because of a friend who left it behind. They're both very scared. Naturally, I'm on their side at this point, and until what happens next. You see, a Mexican couple is also asked to pull over where Shane and Lisa did. So after the officer is done with talking to Shane and Lisa, he goes over to the Mexican couple's car, and let me just read you what happens next. Then I heard a blood-curdling scream and witnessed the cop rip the driver out of the car and throw him to the ground. The wife in the passenger seat jumped out of the car to save him while another cop ran over and tackled her to the ground like a football player from hell. The four enormous bear-sized dogs stampeded over and searched the entire car for drugs while cops handcuffed the couple and threw them into a cage. Lisa, oh my god, me, don't panic. Bzzz, the cop tasered the driver who was in the cage and screaming in Spanish. The wife was crying and clawing at the cage until blood began dripping down her hands onto her arms. It was like the world was ending her life right in front of us. Lisa, oh my god, we're gonna die. Me, no, we're gonna be okay. Call your brother right now. What? You're gonna die? You just witnessed police brutality to the second degree, and all you care about is yourself? Oh, by the way, you'll never guess how the story ends. The officer comes back to their car, he flirts with Lisa, he lets them go back to the US, and they drive all the way home to LA. So, not only did 
nothing happened to the two of you, but you also showed little to no care of what happened to that couple. I'm not saying that Shane should have jumped in front of the taser, but at least write that you were horrified of what was happening to fellow human beings and not just write, oh, I'm so scared of what's gonna happen to me, ooh. You know, Shane, for someone who's a self-proclaimed empath, you have a weird way of showing it. Like, am I, am I wrong? Like, I, I don't know. But it doesn't stop there, folks. That's right, it gets worse. You see, that's how you do comedy, Shane. That's, it's all in the timing. You don't need to say anything shocking or offensive. Like, it's, it's that easy. Does anyone remember a young man by the name of Trayvon Martin? And for those of you who don't, let me refresh your memory. Back in 2012, 17-year-old Trayvon was visiting his father. Enter George Zimmerman, a 28-year-old man who called 911 on Trayvon for merely walking around their neighborhood at night. That's right, I said there because Trayvon's father lived in this gated community as well. Cut to Trayvon and George having a scuffle and Zimmerman ends up shooting Martin in self-defense, thus killing him. And I put quotations there because Trayvon was both unarmed and already seven yards away trying to go back home. Trayvon was a junior in high school who was just visiting family and now he's gone solely because he is black? What the hell does Shane Dawson have to do with any of this? Well, five years ago he said this in a video. Trayvon Martin. <laughs> Well, maybe you wouldn't have been walking this around the streets if you had a job. Oh! <laughs> I just... I, I really just hate watching that clip. Like, after the events of 2020 and the Black Lives Matter movement, it just... Seeing something like that just really just pisses me off and gets under my skin. It's just so different for me from everything else because it's just like now you're naming people who met their tragic demise. I mean, could you imagine someone publicly saying something like this about Breonna Taylor? I mean, that, they'd be finished. I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't give context on this clip of Shane. This is from a video called Talking Shit Challenge. The point of this video was to satirically poke fun at all these challenges that have popped up. You have to pull a name from the hat and roast them. But what makes it a challenge is that all of the names in the hat are people that are unroastable. So Shane pulls out Trayvon Martin's name from the hat, which leads to that clip that I just showed you. Trayvon's name should have never been in that hat. They should have leaned way more into the satire, and it's just not funny at all. The other YouTubers in this clip, which are Steve Green and Nikki Limo, both came out with statements when this clip resurfaced this year. They're pretty decent apologies, but nothing from Shane. This subject definitely should have come up in Shane's taken accountability video. To make things worse, guess what happened to George Zimmerman? Not only was he dropped of all murder charges and let free, but just last December, Zimmerman decided to sue the Martin family for over a hundred million dollars. What? Oh, scum. What an absolute evil leech. Let's wrap up this segment. Is Shane Dawson a racist? Racist used to only mean a person who hated someone because of the color of their skin. But now there's some nuance. Now merely jokes about someone else's ethnicity is beginning to be too much. These days there are no innocent bystanders. You have to be actively anti-racist if you want to see some actual change happen. Also, people just need to start educating themselves more on the history of racism so that they can better understand what it's like for a person of color to go through. Shane Dawson is someone who has done blackface, has said the n-word, and has poked fun at the death of a young black kid. All of that certainly tallies off a racist checklist. But right before his cancellation, Shane was very active in the Black Lives Matter movement. So I don't want to ignore that. If I had to give you a straight answer, Shane Dawson has spent the majority of his life being unintentionally racist. Sure, Shane never meant to bring harm to minorities, but his actions on YouTube over the years say different. And that is because of the environment he grew up in and his lack of education. But I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm simply here to show you the facts, show you the evidence, so that you could draw your own conclusion. I want us to think about having sex with animals at a young age because that fucked me up. Oh yeah, daddy likes. <laughs> I don't even know how to start this one. Not only does Shane Dawson have racist tendencies, but he also has a history of being inappropriate with his pets. I'm sure we're all familiar with the clip from the Shane and Friends podcast where Shane tells the cat story. But for those of you who just saw how long this video was and just threw it on for some background noise, why don't we play it for you? The things I've done to my poor animals, they will never love me. I've done terrible things. I used to, well. <laughs> oh no, I don't know if you want to go there, Shane. What'd you do? <laughs> One time, I laid my cat down on her back. You don't get arrested for this. I don't. I don't know. No. Think about it. Hmm. 
I don't think so. Okay, think go ahead. I didn't penetrate. <laughs> I laid the cat down on her back I and then I, I, I moved her little chicken legs, like, you know, spread open or whatever. And I was like, if I just, like, hump, but, like, on her tummy, like, that's not weird. Like, whatever. And then I humped and I humped and I humped and it kept going and kept going. And I came all over the cat. No, you did not. It was, like, my first sexual experience. No I was also, way. like, 19. <laughs> so it's like, you know. Wait a minute. Wait a second. Did you just say you came on a cat? Guys, I think you have to put money in the meter. Yeah, right? Uh, but you know who likes cats. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're insane. You know, when this controversy first happened last year, I thought to myself, this has to be a joke in bad taste. There's no way this is a thing that happened. But in 2020, several clips of Shane Dawson being inappropriate with his pets have resurfaced. Warning, sound the alarm. <coughs> eh, eh, eh. The following clips I'm about to show you are genuinely disturbing. Like, this isn't a bit. I'm being serious right now. So, if you can't stomach it, uh, please feel free to look away. But, I just have to show you, just just so you know, I'm not making this stuff up here. Go ahead. Make out. <laughs> Want us to think about having sex with animals at a young age because that fucked me up. Oh yeah, daddy likes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I blinged it. Oh, oh my yes. god, he what? does this every time. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, it's it's too much. You know, it's one thing to make off-color jokes about doing inappropriate things to your pets, but it's a different thing entirely, seeing someone do it with your own eyes. Now, of course, we all kiss our cats and dogs on their heads to show them some affection, but what Shane is doing in those clips, he's Frenching these animals, and there was one where he was legitimately humping a puppy, man. Again, it's just one of those things that it's not funny, it's just disgusting. I actually found a comment about the cat clip from the podcast that says it all. Pretty much anything can be joked about, IMO. Dark humor works at its best when the jokes are carefully structured and set up depending on what the subject is. There was no structure or setup or punchline to this joke. He literally just said that he sexually assaulted his pet. Knowing what we know about him now, he probably did do this to his cat. If it was just a joke, then it was kind of just a trash joke. I think this person 100% nails it. If that podcast cat story is a joke, then Shane executed it terribly. Of course people think you're being serious. It's all about how you say things. It's me snapping my fingers terribly in the background. But if this is a real story, I don't know why the fuck he would have ever admit that. Especially given those clips of you doing those terrible things to pets. How is it a joke when you actually do these things? The answer? It's just not. I wonder if PETA has gone after Shane Dawson yet. Now, the big question. Is this something that still happens today? Because as I'm sure you're aware, Shane and his fiance have quite a few pets. I'm not gonna talk in absolutes here, but Rylan to me always seemed like someone who wouldn't take that shit if he saw it happening. I hope that he's at least seen the clips that I've shown you here, but I feel like if he were to catch Shane in the act of doing inappropriate stuff with their pets today, then he wouldn't let it continue. Oh. Where's the bathroom in this place? So I typed in naked baby. First of all, I don't understand why anybody would be turned on by that. But, the first good thing we said, but, they were sexy. Whew. Okay, that was weird. I think this is by far the worst subject to discuss, just because I think we can all unanimously agree that pedophiles are just, they commit the worst crimes, they're the biggest scums of the earth, and just, they're just the worst people, just like ever. There's just so much to go through in this section. There's a reason why I saved it for last. First of all, 
Sexualizing children has been such a staple of the entertainment industry. For the lack of a better word, it's actually insane. From toddlers and tiaras, to Bart Simpson's penis being in the Simpsons movie, to the Losers Club in the It books having a gangbang, to Bad Grandpa, to even this year when Netflix released the foreign film Cuties. And surely let's not forget all of the little kids dancing on TikTok to Cardigan B music. It's all over the place and it truly needs to end, that goes without saying. Or else we'll continue to see influencers like Shane Dawson who doesn't understand the gravity of what they're doing and it could potentially be scarring to whomever is involved. While we're on traditional media, let's talk about the Willow Smith situation. There's an old clip of Shane where he motions J-O to a poster of the 11-year-old pop star. Clearly not cool, not funny, just awful. But the crazy thing is that somehow the Smith family gets a hold of this clip and they are of course furious. Jaden Smith puts out a very aggressive statement and Jada Pinkett Smith was the bigger person putting a more of a subtle statement out there. These celebrities involving themselves amplify the cancellation of Shane Dawson times 10. To be honest, Shane had this specifically coming for a long time now. Shane has a history with the Smith family. And I'm not just talking about the Will Smith clip, no, 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 no. Listen to this. Can what? we talk about Will Smith for a minute? Um, not, I'm sorry, we were talking about black people and then Will Smith popped mm -hmm. in my head right away. Uh -huh. um, now, am I the only one that's like annoyed by his son? Nope. He's going on all these talk shows and he's not smiling. It looks angry all the time. And he, it, something about him frustrates me. And when that movie bombed at the box office, I got so happy. He looks like a praying mantis. <laughs> he's definitely oh not God. coming on the show, by the way. We're not going to get him after this. <laughs> Willow Smith. Uh, well, Willow, maybe we got her though. She's good. Mm, I feel like she's just a robot. Like oh, I feel yeah. like Jada Pinkett like plugs her in at night. Yeah. And then like <laughs> unplugs her, and it, it's like this weird. I've seen her in interviews, and she, they're like, "Oh, are you excited about having the number one song?" And she's like, uh, 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 "Yes, I am very excited to be doing so well in this community of musicians." It was so fake and so weird, and I don't know. Yeah, I kind I kind of buy the robot thing too. It's kind of weird. Know. Now Willow Smith stayed silent throughout all of this, which is good for her. It takes so much strength to remain quiet when something like this happens. However, there is one Smith that has been unusually quiet throughout all of this. And believe it or not, I'm not referring to Trey Smith. No, I'm talking about the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air himself, Will Smith. You see, for some reason, the head of the Smith household, the father of Willow, did not breathe a word about this online. Why? It's not like he doesn't know about this. Because A, his son and wife publicly talked about this, and B, Will has a big presence on the platform this happened on. People were waiting for Will Smith to put the final nail in Shane's coffin, but radio silence. Now I could just say no one knows for sure, so let's move on, but let's do something more fun and speculate. Could it be that Will Smith saw the clip as what Shane intended it to be, which is a stupid joke done in poor taste? Maybe it has to do with the fact that he's been in Hollywood for 30 years and remembers when jokes about minors were more accepted, especially when you think about the few times that his character said inappropriate things about minors in The Fresh Prince. Right now I'm considering a 15 year old daughter. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Banks. Steffi, do your parents know you're here? To hell with my parents. Make sure you stay friends with that one in the pink over there, you know what I mean? A couple more years of seasoning, you know, put a little barbecue sauce on you. Yeah? Let them marinate. You oh, know get, what out. Mean? get out. I could provide context for these clips, but do you need context for the Shane clip as well? No. All three of these clips just age super poorly. Though I'm sure a lot of you are looking for a more realistic answer. It's very possible Will didn't want to add fuel to the fire and that Jaden and Jada had pretty much said it all and there's not much more to add. But I'm just reaching here. You guys are right. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Seriously? Oh, except, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about Jeffrey Epstein? It's weird I'm bringing him up, right? Well, Epstein had... Epstein had an infamous little black book containing names of a bunch of public figures and their contact info. And just who was among these names? Will Smith. Again, for legal reasons, I cannot stress enough that all of this Will Smith discussion is just speculation. I cannot say with 100% certainty that any of that is a fact. Also, I wouldn't have to do any of this had Will Smith just said fuck Shane Dawson like six months ago. That's all I ask, man. Like, your silence speaks volumes, dude. By the way, none of this is justification for what Shane did. I think he absolutely still needs to apologize to the Smith family. It doesn't matter how long ago it was or his intent because a clip like that is just something 
uh, so traumatic. Like, a family can't unsee that. All right, let's move on to the sexy baby clip. Which sounds so bad out of context. For those who don't know, way back in the third episode of Shane and Friends, Shane said this. No, but this child was probably six years old. And um, I was taking a picture of something. And the kid turns to me and goes, oh, are you Instagramming? And the six-year-old girl goes, um, oh, how many followers do you have? I mean, first of all, it was almost like one of those contests where it's like, how big is your dick? Why do you have so many followers? And she goes, oh, I'm a cheerleader. And I'm like, oh, really? And she shows me her Instagrams, which are like, first of all, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but like, she's like sexy. You're disgusting. I know. Listen, we've talked about pedophilia no, no, this before. Is the, Shane, like, <laughs> like, do not say this. And do, like, I don't even want to talk about it. Like, you will get arrested. Like. <laughs> the worst part of it. I actually went to Google and I'm like, oh, I don't want to see. You can I get don't arrested. Wanna, I know, but I didn't want to see child porn. But I just wanted to see like, okay, let me just pretend. Yeah. Let me pretend like I'm a pedophile for a sec. So I typed in naked baby. First of all, I don't understand why anybody would be turned on by that. Okay. But. That's the first good thing you said. But. They were sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, back to the Instagram. Is oh. she like Honey Boo Boo? Is she fat? No, she was like the skinny little sexy six-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we please move on? No, it's so frustrating talking about this guy. Now, Shane was already exposed for this clip back in 2018. A YouTube channel by the name of Pop Blast released this clip with scary music and visuals to paint the story. This was huge. The first big pedophile allegation Shane ever got. Shane put out an apology and it was quickly dismissed. And it did put air quotes around apology because he has a few small sorries in it, but he mainly focuses on debunking the clip and shifting blame into other places. Also, he just kind of lies at one point. So I was saying, you know, well, she was sexy. But then right away, I'd be like, I'm just kidding. Of course, when they posted that, they would cut out the I'm just kidding. Okay, Shane, you did say you were kidding, but it was for a quick second. I almost missed it while I was listening back to this clip because of how fast you said it. Not to mention you continue with this joke story, so it's hard to tell if you're still kidding, which is why most people don't say that they're kidding until the very end of the joke. As far as my personal opinion, I lean towards this podcast clip being a joke. Just like the cat podcast clip, it has the same cadence of a Shane Dawson joke. You know, not an actual joke where there's, you know, mental representation of the setup, followed by incongruity and its multiple interpretations, and then executed with its punchline. By the way, that is how cognitive psychologists break down humor. But at the same time, I don't blame you if you believe that this story is real, given Shane's history online and everything that has come out this year. Also, I listened to this clip in its entirety in order to get the full context, and at one point, you talk about your justification for pedophilia listen he, he allegedly has justification justification for pedophilia okay. and it's so disturbing and like i, I just pretend that he doesn't <laughs> okay wait, no, like, no let me explain let no. me explain oh god here's my justification for pedophilia i can't okay first of all let me just say having sex with children or touching children or anything of that nature is terrible sure. and you should not do it but <laughs> but <laughs> but here's my thing people have foot fetishes people have fetishes about you know everything so why is it when somebody looks at a google's like naked baby on google and jerks off to it they can get arrested because, i don't understand because that. There's a naked baby because they had to because somebody took a picture of a naked baby. You don't bring that up in this apology, and it also sounds like a legitimate justification you had. Not to mention, you also brought up this same justification and out of the blue 24 episodes later. Now, in the racism segment, I talked about all the different ways that Shane Dawson was racist. So apparently, it's in his nature to have a few different ways to sexualize children. There's just so much to comb through, man. I'll, I'll try to get through as much of it as I can. The Fine Bros made a show called Hey, It's Millie that Shane Dawson was a part of. It was a series starring an eight-year-old puppet character who was very sexualized. Is this the right way to do it in a good way? You could be a little more gentle. You know what we could do, Millie? What? Motorbike! That's the only clip I'm going to show you because they're all like that. And plus, I don't want to keep seeing them. Not at all funny. It doesn't pull any punches either. 
in a, you know, a bad way. Also, I have to mention Shane has a history of obsessing over young female stars. This list includes Rebecca Black, Jojo Siwa, Bad Baby, Charlie D'Amelio, and plenty of others. Now, normally this isn't something that's immediately alarming, but given the history of Shane Dawson, red flags are thrown up in the air. Fortunately, he's walked away from making sexual jokes about these girls, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, Rebecca Black got it the worst. So many of these jokes were aimed towards her in the first era of the Shane and Friends podcast. She even commented on it in her second episode. Also, quick side note, I believe she was 16 in this clip. I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of things that I feel like I should be ta like I should think are creepy, <laughs> but I don't like mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's you. Mm -hmm. Um There's also a clip of both Shane and Lisa talking to Shane's underage cousin about sex. Now, are you on your period Stop right it. now? What? I'm trying to get answers. <laughs> How do you I'm going to give you anything? So close. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 12. She's this on is period, feels very right? no, what? Are you? No, you're not on your period? You bleed. No. Now listen, you have a boyfriend, right? Yeah. Now what did I tell you? When he says, can I put it in, you say... No. Good. <laughs> High five, girlfriend. Again, awful. I assume what they were going for is when cousins meet up during holidays and ask each other anything, whether it was inappropriate or not. At least that's what I get when Shane describes this in his taking accountability as a weird family moment. But in this case, it's just too much. Especially because of the huge age difference between Shane and his cousin. But outside of YouTube content, Shane was flat out inappropriate when interacting with his fans. Around 2011 to 2012, he and other creators would use a platform called Tiny Chat, which is basically just like Chat Roulette or Omegle. Most of these Tiny Chat clips I found are pretty harmless until I found this one. I am so sweaty right now. Oh my god, can you guys see my pants? <laughs> you did, huh? I was like itching myself and I'm not wearing any pants. And then I realized I was on camera. This is a bad idea. Anytime I do these tiny chats, I always say something or show something inappropriate. Oh my god, you so can't say that. Like he can see pretty much everyone else in that chat room was a kid. He may not even know he was being recorded. That, that's the scary part. Also, why is he never wearing pants? Do you remember earlier how I saw his penis? It's because again, he wasn't wearing any pants and he was on camera. It's just so alarming how comfortable he is with just like no pants on and he can see everyone that's watching him. It's a live studio audience. I hope it's becoming abundantly clear that this is goes way beyond offensive and shock humor. Shane still has all the shit to answer for. This is why people aren't so willing to forgive him and move on. I can keep going with a hundred different clips, but I've highlighted the ones that I felt like were the most important to bring up. Plus, this video does not need to be five hours. I actually did want to highlight that all these clips and images are coming from seven plus years ago. A couple of years ago, Shane made a series of videos around having a daughter and having a son. And because of all this history, it's uncomfortable rewatching these series. So out of curiosity, I wanted to know if either of them had said something this year about Shane. As far as I can tell, Sophia stayed quiet about Shane, which I definitely understand why. But the young boy who played Shane's son actually did say something on his personal social media when asked directly. I'm about to show you the screenshot, but I blurred out the handles because I would feel weird if I made this eight year old's Instagram public, so I'm not gonna do that. Shane has done wrong things. He was nice to me while I was there, but his actions can't be excused. That's honestly incredible. Like, I'm very impressed that this little kid can see both sides of the situation. You know, when you see a celebrity get into trouble, usually you see their celebrity friends stick up for them by saying something along the lines of, hey, he was always cool to me, man, which is like, okay. Like, they might have been nice to you, but that doesn't necessarily mean they didn't commit whatever they're being accused of. But not for this eight year old, no sorry, he knows what's up. Now much like racism has been slowly changing, meaning pedophilia is also going through a social change. I think that's why Shane got so angry at his pedo apology in 2018. He denies being a pedophile because he must know in his head that he never actually molested anybody. In 2020, pedophilia is starting to define as sexualizing children of any kind. It's kind of like when people started to realize that abuse is not just physical, it's also mental. But the issue really comes in when the majority of people outside of the internet culture have never heard of Shane Dawson in their life. To those people, pedophilia still solely means the act of raping children, and unfortunately it's gonna stay like that for a while. So I implore you to be very careful when using the word because we still have two giant groups of people who can't agree on the definition just yet. With all that being said, it's time to answer the million dollar question. Is Shane Lee Ya a pedophile? And in this case, I am talking about the original definition. Honestly, I can't say with 100% certainty. I'm just a small time commentator. However, I wanted to do something here that'll make you sway one way 
or another. So I decided the best way is to just look up how to identify a pedophile and the website we'll be using today is called projectchance.org. It's very important to note that the website specifically says that these characteristics alone is not enough to conclusively determine if somebody is a pedophile or not. But I still want to go through the list just out of curiosity to see how many of these does Shane check off. Okay, after going through the list, out of 21 characteristics of pedophiles, Shane Dawson, ladies and gentlemen, drumroll please, he only got 11. Only half. While I was doing research for this, I also found a website called themomandbeareffect.org. I didn't use that one because it's specifically aimed towards people who are in your life. So if that sounds like something that you need, I'll link that in the description, as well as this first website and also a Black Lives Matter movement. By the way, that's a weird thing I noticed about Shane's taking accountability video. Like you'd think in that description, he'd have websites, links to uh, awareness of pedophiles and Black Lives Matter, but no, you didn't have anything in there, so. Thank you for watching this. If you watched the whole thing, thank you so much. And I hope that you learned some lessons from me, especially if you're young. I hope you learned a lot of lessons from uh, everything that I have done. The duality of Shane Dawson is a slippery slope. On the Dr. Jekyll side of Shane, you see a person who grew up extremely poor, whose alcoholic father abandoned him and his family, who was molested, who was confused about his sexuality, who at one point was 400 pounds, who grew up in a family that had a very shitty sense of humor, who is severely anxious, who suffers from an eating disorder, who is easily manipulated, who received no equity when he left Maker Studios, which Disney ended up buying for $500 million, who sees everyone and everything as sexual objects, someone who really hated himself. But on the Mr. Hyde side, you'd see a person who really doesn't know how to do comedy properly, who plays the victim card constantly, who makes very impulsive decisions that lead to trouble, who treats people different based on whether he likes them or not, who has done a lot of blackface, who has made jokes about a young black kid being killed, who has touched animals very inappropriately, who has had very creepy interactions with underage kids, who has sexualized children, someone who has done things that people can never forgive. And I thought I was a mess. What? So how does the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde end? Well, spoiler alert, the novella ends with Henry Jekyll taking his own life. Now, at the time of filming this, we're starting to see Shane slowly return to the internet. He's been posting on his Instagram stories, making cameos in Rylan's videos, and he also appeared in Rylan's podcast, The Sip, when their cat tragically passed away. He'll definitely return to his YouTube channel at some point in 2021. Now, here's the question that I have for everybody. Is there anything that Shane Dawson could possibly do at this point that would actually make you forgive him? The big issue with criticism online is that a lot of people will point out the problem, but then not offer any sort of solution. It's not like Shane Dawson can pop into a time machine and go back in time and stop his younger self from doing all these things, because if there was a way, he'd definitely do it. Here's what I think is the most realistic resolution. I don't know who. But somebody should go meet up with Shane and so that he has a chance to go through all his controversies, they can talk through everything, and he can apologize for it all. The taking accountability video, I mean, it's just not enough. This video that I'm talking about has to go through every single example. Now, that is a long list, but it's really the only way to make it right at this point. Somebody has to do to Shane what Shane should have done to Jake Paul. And no going easy on him either. Even if he starts crying, you gotta remain stone cold. I've seen some people speculate that Shane Dawson's gonna return with a docuseries about himself. Now, I just don't see it happening, to be quite honest with you. I mean, it's the same reason why iDubs won't make a content cop on himself. There's just too much bias. It needs to come from an outside source. The way I see it, my idea is the closest thing to a resolution. Shane, I know that it looks like right now any decision you make is the wrong one, but don't let that get in the way of you making a proper apology. If you just come back with a conspiracy theory video or a doc about something else, then the road to redemption is just going to be way more difficult. Sure, the majority of people are going to forget about all this two years from now, but honestly, I still think that's the wrong call. So with all that being said, the ball is in your court. You know what you Hey, what's going on? Let me go! 
Camilo, what is this some kind of joke? I warned you, George. You should have listened. What do you mean? And and who are these people? Don't worry about them. This is between you and me. What is? You know it's really sad. I have to go to the extreme measures to get you to listen to me. Are you gonna tell me, or are you just gonna keep rambling? It's what I've been telling you since we were at the house. You don't listen. You don't take responsibility for your actions. You're a completely different person. I don't know what you want me to say. I think you're exaggerating. Oh really? Yeah, really. Then tell me why I got a call from your parents asking what's wrong with you. What? They're worried sick about you. Everything they said, I, I've been trying to tell you. You're... You're lying. It's true. Everyone that sees you agrees. This is gonna end tonight. Well, what you gotta say for yourself? Can you see now that all he does is screw everything up? Whoa, 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 I'm not the only guilty party here. I have a hard time believing that level-headed human beings can do what they're doing to us right now. Surrounding yourself with people like you can drive someone to madness. Give it to me. You cannot be serious. Fuck off, I know what I'm doing. Uh, you clearly don't. I can get us out of this. No, 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 don't even look at him. If you give it to me, I can resolve all of this. How? Apologizing for your behavior, of course. Oh, come on, the situation has escalated to the point of no return. You're wrong. It sounds to me that they civilly still want to resolve this, so saying sorry goes a long way. And as soon as you learn that, we can start growing more and more as a person. Please don't tell me you're actually buying this crap. How can you expect people to forgive and forget if you never take accountability from all your mistakes from the past? I'm honestly falling asleep here. Just give it to me. Don't listen to him. He's delusional. The only way out of this is to fight, not half-assed apologies and empty promises. He's tricking you. You're the only one that's manipulating here. Listen to me. Do it. Stop. Excellent. I can't watch this. You gotta say for yourself. I've had enough! Let go of me! You can't do this to me! George! Let go! You can't do this to me! Calm down! Oh, just you wait, Camilo. As soon as I free myself, I am gonna fuck you up! <laughs> oh, what's the matter? You can't look me in the eyes anymore? Starting to get scared? Good! We tried it his way. You know what to do. Yeah? I tried my best, but my words are not getting to him. Started to get scared? Good! Tie his hands behind his back. What? Oh. <laughs> Camille, what are you doing? No, that's it. I'm done with you. You can't do this to me! No, George, you put this upon yourself. Ah! Cover his mouth. I've done listening to him. You know what? Punch him. Here's the Throw him out. I think we took this too far. There was no reasoning with him. But it's not enough. enough. Thank you so much for watching this video everybody make sure to like comment subscribe share just all the good things that the algorithm eats up if you do want to financially support what i do here then luckily for the first time ever i am selling merch and here's the design whoa nice isn't it it's based off the mask that was shown off in this video and available in multiple colors shirts and hoodies will be available at teespring.com the link is in the description Again, I've never done anything like this before, so I just wanted to try it out and see how it goes. I'm excited to be going back to regular uploads starting in 2021, so look forward to that. Until then, happy holidays! Can you believe I've uploaded this the day after Christmas? Pfft, I sure can't.